Does manual treasury management and operations have your crypto business stuck in the slow lane? Scale up and speed ahead with Fireblocks, the number one platform for crypto operations and trading pros that makes custody, settlement, and rebalancing quick and easy. Visit fireblocks.com to learn more. This episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, an integrated solution that provides institutional investors with an advanced trading platform, secure custody, and prime services to manage all of their crypto assets in one place. Futuristic companies like Tesla and MicroStrategy have used Coinbase's comprehensive investing platform to execute some of the largest trades in the industry. Learn more by visiting coinbase.com prime to get started today. I'd also like to give a shout out to Cross River. Whether you're a crypto exchange, NFT marketplace, or wallet, Cross River's integrated API-based platform provides the payment solutions you need to grow. A CryptoFin industry award winner and an early partner for companies like Coinbase, Cross River's tech stack supports crypto partners and enables real-time money movement for consumers. Welcome to a new world of crypto-friendly banking at crossriver.com crypto. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, Director of News at The Block. And today we have another DAO episode for you. On the other side of the mic, we are joined by my guests, my esteemed guests, Irene Zhao, founder of Irene DAO, and Ben Tang, co-founder of SoCol. Guys, thanks so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate you making the time. Yeah, thanks for having thanks us. Thanks for having us. I love the enthusiasm, despite, I guess you guys just moved. How's the process coming together? You've created some sort of a DAO compound for the two of you. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that it's not really a DAO compound. I guess it's more of like an event space and kind of a space to bridge the NFT and the real world, right? So what we're trying to do over here is that we want to see how NFTs can kind of enhance the interaction and improve that experience. Yeah, yeah. there's a ton of stuff going on, but let's just take a step back and explain the background for people not familiar with Irene, anyone who is maybe not plugged into the crypto Twitter world, a very fun, funny account to follow. You kind of are known for your sense of humor. When you decided to create Irene Dow, what was the thinking there? Were you trying to engage more with your audience? How did it all come together? And then how did you get tied up with Ben? Yeah. All right. Maybe I'll just share a little bit of history because Irene Dow actually came after SoCal, right? So the whole background was last year I was looking at NFTs. I was investing <clears> in crypto <throat> since 2016. But last year when NFTs came about, I was really, really excited about that. At a point of time, Irene was, was kind of also looking into the crypto space because a friend pulled her in to kind of do like a CMO type of role. And we have just been thinking about this idea about, you know, expanding nfts into the social space kind of bringing nfts more into like the membership card type of utility and uh we have been thinking about this all the way until like october we finally decided to do that but when we first started doing web3 social a lot of the investors a lot of people within the crypto space didn't believe that web3 social could work i think uh, you guys know all of the other apps right like the bitcloud the diso and yep. all of these apps most of them just don't really get mainstream because i think a lot of the ways that DeFi or like the experiences on DeFi, the experiences on crypto are very different from what like a lot of influencers actually require we know this because I, I met irene six years ago when she only had 300 followers and basically since then right since 300 followers to like you know the half a million followers that she has right now uh, we've been kind of working together going for influencer events doing all these brand partnerships I'm basically the guy behind the camera, like uh, helping. Yeah, he helped me took a lot of photos. Oh, yeah, so yeah. he's the guy taking all the photos. Yeah, I took all the photos. Like when I was an influencer, I kind of do a lot of advertisements, right? Last time I usually like post three paid ads per week. That's really a lot. And Ben is the one who is taking all these pictures for me. Yeah, yeah. Just just a little bit of context because for three years, you know, Irene was working as an iron ore broker. 
and I was working as a quant. So we both were working in the financial district in Singapore. So we would like during lunchtime, we'll go for yoga class. I help her to take some photos. And then after work, we'll just go to the, the river and take some photos. You know, it's like, it's just like more convenient because we work so close to each other. And, and that was how we, we took like a, most of the photos that made her popular right on Instagram first. Before after that, she went over to Twitter. So we kind of understand the, the influencer space. space. Yeah, you know, well. like six, seven years ago when we yeah. first started doing this, you know, influencer marketing wasn't really even a thing, right? And now you can see like the monetization methods have just changed so much over the past six and seven years. So the thing is that we think that we have some kind of knowledge of this space that the people within CT, we just have a different view from them, right? And we wanted to kind of uh, show that it's not that Web3 Social doesn't work. It's just that the current ways that people are doing it is wrong so we started so called and you know the response was just kind of like lukewarm people didn't really think that it could work and you know how we actually started was uh, from a sticker pack have you seen the irene stickers uh, on telegram yes of course i was just talking with davis about them i use them frequently <laughs> which yeah. one do you like the most is it a good morning one <laughs> the good morning one is always an easy one to deploy out there so how did you guys come up with that yeah so what happened was that uh, we were creating a Telegram group. It was actually a private link. I don't even know how her fans managed to find that link. But one day, it was just a private group. And suddenly, people start pouring in. And they just started, you know, fanboying over Irene. Or maybe fangirling, right? We don't know the agenda. So they started, like, talking about Irene. They started posting pictures of her inside the so-called group. Eventually, the idea of stickers floated. Everybody was like, we need Irene stickers. We need Irene stickers. So I'm like, okay, guys. I'll do Irene sticker pack. You guys kind of give me some contributions. So we started with a few. I did a couple of stickers. The fans did a couple of stickers. The internals, they kind of like chipped in and did a few stickers. And then we created sticker pack. And this sticker pack, we only shared it within a group. But we realized that, like, you know, within four days, it had like 2,000 plus installs. And our group only had like 200 members. So obviously, people were just like secretly coming to the group, <laughs> taking the sticker packs and like going out and sharing it with everybody. And eventually, there was one of the fans of Irene, is this uh, anonymous developer called uh, Lip EVM. He was a huge fan of Irene, and he's also a huge fan of the sticker pack. And he came and uh, messaged Irene. I'll let Irene uh, talk about how he, how he talked to you at the start. Yeah, so he just came and messaged me, said, oh, I love the sticker pack idea. It was amazing. But now I want to make it to NFT. So at that time, Gozali, the, the, the Indonesian boy who posts a selfie every day, went viral. Like his face is almost everywhere. And then uh, Libby VM said, um, probably we should make your photos into NFT as well. But at that time, we were kind of, we were not very sure about the idea because yeah, no, the actually, quality of the sticker is not very good. And we don't want it to be seen as a cash grab. Yeah, yeah, because at the point of time, you know, we were very serious in the fundraising. Um, yeah. yeah, and then we were kind of like building the product. And we didn't want it to seem like, you know, we are distracted from our main startup, which is so cold, right? So initially, we kind of said no to doing it as an NFT. But, you know, after a while, I was just thinking about it and was like, maybe we could use this as an opportunity mm. to kind of like validate some of our key hypotheses, especially the, the idea that we had around Web3 Social. So we discussed it, right? Myself, Irene and Lip, uh, we were all on board. We say that this is a proof of concept. We're not going to take any money. Yeah. Um, this is just going to be a way for us to test where, how NFTs could potentially increase the interaction between users and fans. And we did this project. And that was how Irene Dow started. Yeah, we also want, kind of want to like, reward our early supporters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, I mean, a lot of early supporters, Irene's fans, right? Even back uh, in Instagram, they were kind of messaging her like, when are you going to do your own NFT? Like, I, I really want to kind of support. I want to buy this. And this is an avenue for them to do that. So basically, Ben, what we're looking at here in Irene Dow is a proof of concept yeah. of what SoCal is trying to provide a foundation for other projects to do or other influencers to capitalize on. I mean, the thing is that like, this is just one of the ideas, right, that, that we're kind of like expanding on. 
So for SoCal, I think the core uh, mission for us is two parts. One is that we want to kind of like improve the narrative because right now when people think of NFTs, mm -hmm. um, the only things that they think about are profile pic NFTs, art NFTs. And you know, the pitch for NFTs for people has always been like, oh, you truly own the content. This is on the blockchain. This is decentralized. But most of the normal people, I mean, I mean, normal people as a non-crypto people, right? Most of these don't really make sense to them, right? And then um, obviously there is value in those like OG projects like CryptoPunks or like Bored Ape Yacht Club, just like, you know, you have like your luxury goods like Gucci or LV. These are like have a long history and it build up the brand over time, right? But the thing is that for most people, right, they, they're looking for like the H&M, the Uniqlo of NFTs. And, and when they're looking for things like that, they're looking more at utility. What can I exactly do with these NFTs? What can they bring for me, right? And for us, we want to kind of show different use cases of that. So for example, like Irene Dao is kind of like fan club. Fan club is an NFT as an as a DAO, right? Fan club membership as an NFT, right? For instance, in our house, we're gonna have events, we're gonna have concept kitchen, they're like three-star Michelin chefs. They're gonna provide a culinary experience. And again, the membership is gonna be an NFT, right? And the idea for us is actually to kind of show people your party ticket invite can be an NFT and what benefit can this bring you? Now this can be an interactive experience. You can get airdrop to Slovenia. Yeah. You can kind of like vote for the theme on the party, transfer it to your friends. All of these things you can actually do with NFTs. This is one of the, the, the key mission of what we're trying to do. So it's true, like what we're trying to prove over here is prove the social concept, but that's not the only thing we want to prove. And I think uh, you'll see in the coming months, we're going to push out a lot of interesting concepts to kind of show people that NFTs can be a lot more than just a picture mainly to an NFT, more than just a profile picture. And obviously the other side, our core business is providing infrastructure for non-crypto people to very easily get into NFTs. So that kind of explains or provides a bit of a defense against the argument that a lot of these drops are just cash grabs. If I were to use an example of myself, you know, I have a pretty nice mustache. If I were to go out and take 500 pictures of them in various settings and raise a lot of money in a similar fashion to Irene Dow, that would be a cash grab. But what you're trying to do is create a more holistic experience for the people involved, the community members, the NFT holders that are within the Irene Dow community. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, you, you can't say it as a cash grab because we didn't take any money from it, right? So it's, yeah. it's obviously not a cash grab. I mean, most of the money is, you know, either we donated it to charity or, or it's kind of still within the, the treasury. And yeah. I think Irene Dow kind of revolutionized the way the creator is able to interact with the fans. Because you know, right, the relationship between creator and fans tend to be very transactional yeah. because the creator just give them uh, exclusive content and then the fans just pay money in return but it's not really the best relationship and it doesn't really solve any problem of the many to one problem because right now it's like many fans to worship like one yeah, creator yeah. or the creator cannot possibly like give attention to all their fans. But right yeah. now because of DAO, all the fans are able to unite together to come together and come up with something that really aligns with the creator's vision. Like for example, last time the Gozali was pretty popular and yeah. actually one of our DAO members was in Indonesia and he went to the Gozali's house to negotiate the partnership between Irene Dao and Gozali. And he agreed to do Gozali's homework for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so that, that is the kind of things, right? It's like really the grassroots movement. I kind of see it as fan club as a DAO, fan club like uh, with your NFT as a membership. Because right now the fans, you know, when, when you are a big fan of some celebrity or some influencer, mm. uh, they maybe they do a lot of work. But there's no like proper incentive structure. There's no way that they can easily kind of contribute to the fan club, right? But we know that the fans actually want to kind of engage, right? Mm -hmm. We look at like K-pop fans, they pull money together, they form an entity, they're gonna buy a huge billboard just to say happy birthday to their favorite BTS member, right? So these are the kind of things that fans wanna do. And over here, we have an incentive structure where you own this NFT, mm -hmm. which gives you membership to the DAO, right? And not, not only that, by owning this NFT, you own a stake in the DAO. As it kind of increases, right? As there are more, more projects, there are more partnerships, more people want to kind of join, the value of your membership actually increases. So now fans are actually, firstly, they're incentivized to promote this fan club, promote the creator. And secondly, is that there is a structure around where you can actually see who are the other fans around the world and kind of work together, do things, do partnerships, do initiatives and all of these things.
So the tagline for Irene Dow is revolutionizing the creator economy with simp to earn. Yeah. Simp to earn. Explain this. Yeah. All right. So obviously we need to have that kind of meme element, right? If there wasn't a meme element, it wouldn't be viral. Sim to earn because a lot of people were talking about like Irene's fans as sims and everything. So we decided to play along with the joke. But the idea is this. The fans, maybe it's like you have Instagram model that you're a big fan of or maybe a celebrity or whatever, right? People spend a lot of time, energy, effort, fangirling, fanboying, or some people call it like simping over their favorite creator. Yes. And it's a wide range of creators, right? Yeah. Athletes, musicians, models. I simp for some of my favorite singer-songwriters like Billy Joel. I'm a big Billy Joel simp. So this model can be replicated. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah I think when people always think of like sims has to be a guy, you know, yeah. simping over uh, like, a, like a pretty girl. But, you know, it's really not that. I mean, Irene sims for a lot of people, right? All kinds of people, like you say, like there are people who write books, there are people who like write songs and Irene sims over them. Yeah. The idea is that we spend so much time and energy to simp over our favorite creators. What if we could actually channel some of this energy, right, into something that's productive and something that aligns with the creator? Because, for example, like the K-pop example that I mentioned just now, right, they spend so much money and they try to coordinate so much just to get a billboard to say happy birthday to their favorite K-pop star. But the thing is that, did a K-pop star actually want this? Maybe he actually supports another cause. Maybe he wants to do something else with the yeah. money, right? Uh, but you don't know because right now there is no organization where all of the fans are kind of like gathered, incentivized, and working on partnerships together. Yeah, and the thing is, Sim to Earn is definitely not going to be viral in Web 2 because in Web 2, there's just no way for you to achieve this with the Web 2 technology. Yeah. Because no matter how long you spend watching a YouTube video, how much time you spend on watching a, your favorite live Twitch streamer doing a live stream, you are not part of it. But on Web 3, however, if you start following early enough and pick the right content creator, you can really join the growth and reap yeah. the reward. Yeah. And this is the technology that only Web 3 is able to provide. Yeah. And we believe NFT is it's the right medium that yeah. makes the new, um, you know, creator economy possible. Yeah. The key word here is ownership, yeah. right? Because in Web2, you cannot own a stake in the creator's fan club. Here, you can actually own a stake in it through NFTs. Yeah, it removes the rent-seeking intermediary and directly makes users, fans, the owners. I want to make something clear here, which is simp to earn is basically a meme. Right, that capitalizes on what we see a lot in the Twitter world. You know, people who maybe come to the defense of a certain Twitter celebrity might be a simp, right? Mm -hmm. This is kind of the definition. It's almost like a white knight. But what simp to earn really represents here is a new set of tools and a toolbox for creators to engage more closely with their fans with the people who follow them, et cetera. So this is really going to have a big impact potentially on what is the influencer economy or the creator economy. Walk us through how Soul Call might work with other types of influencers. Let's say they're they're in the sports vertical or the fashion vertical. Yeah. What can they do to engage with their audience members leveraging these new tools? So the first thing just by itself, right, the nature of like a DAO and NFT community is that the fans are actually in the same place. They can kind of do events together. They can kind of uh, work together. Like maybe somebody knows design, somebody knows development. They want to kind of organize like a quick event. Somebody is an event space. They can come together within this uh, community to actually organize something. And this has happened a, a few times already, right? Even Irene Dao, I've met like a bunch of people from Irene Dao at Eve Denver. We're like, oh, we're all like Dao members. We kind of like just meet up over here. So that's the community aspect, like which the creator doesn't really need to do anything. It's just kind of like putting people together to kind of work on things that they're going to do anyway because they love the creator. I think on top of that, what most people actually are looking for, it is the utility on top of that. And when I say utility, I think in DeFi or like traditional crypto, people always think of utility in a financial sense. But what these fans actually want is something that's more uh, sentimental, something that's more meaningful. So I can't really say so much for like, you know, specific cases because right now we haven't really been working with 
any sports teams right now. But the thing is that we have worked with other celebrities on different kind of projects. And some of the ideas that they have are like, you know, the NFT uh, gives you membership to this community. And, you know, along the way, they're going to airdrop like dinner party invites, right? Special events, backstage pass, maybe, you know, things like a five minute phone call NFT, things like these could be ideas of how like a sports influencer, uh, like a pro athlete could actually leverage NFTs to be able to engage the community. So like what I talked about just now, right? One of the key things about NFTs is that you can create them on one app, but you can use them on any app within the Ethereum ecosystem. This actually makes it a lot easier for people to kind of share it, sell it. They can bring it to their metaverse house. Let's say you have like a ticket or to a special game, which is a NFT ticket, right? You can put it in your metaverse house or, you know, maybe even like with, with SoCo, you can actually maybe create a group chat with all of the people who kind of attended the game, right? Because you can see whose wallet actually has this ticket. And on top of that, you can also see analytics. The interesting thing is that the rewards, for example, maybe you bought 10 tickets from this pro athlete, you watch all of his games. And another organization, which is maybe his fan club, could actually then airdrop you something which is like completely unlinked because you can just check everybody's wallet and see who has at least 10 tickets in their wallet and drop them a souvenir. You get invited to the super fan party. Okay, real quick though. One thing I don't understand is why do you need a DAO to do a lot of this stuff? Why can't you just do it through an NFT, attach all these community rights to the NFTs? Why do you need the DAO structure kind of wrapped around it? And the answer is that we don't. In this special case, which is a fan club, you know, you have funds within a fan club and people want to vote and decide how to spend the funds. Therefore, you kind of need a structure, right, for accountability so that people know where the funds are going, they can vote for where the funds are going. But if you're talking about like just issuing tickets, if the creator is in charge, right, it's not a community-ran organization, this does not need to be a DAO. And that's why SoCo is not a DAO tooling startup at its core. We are basically NFT infrastructure. We make it easy for people to buy NFTs, easy for creators to kind of issue NFTs. Pure technology play, we do not take any cut from them. Makes sense. So that raises an interesting question, which is when is it appropriate to set up a DAO? Yeah. And when is it inappropriate? If you were working with a specific client, how would you advise on whether or not that would be the preferred move? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The thing is that if I'm working with a specific client, like an organization or a celebrity or something like that, this should indicate that it's almost 99% or more that it shouldn't be a doubt. Because this by itself is a point of centralization, right? I mean, I guess the key thing here is that if you want to set up a DAO, it needs to be something that is at its core community ran. I think a lot of people, they kind of look at DAOs and they kind of like want to turn everything into a DAO. It makes sense, I guess, for something that's more grassroots or, you know, it's like a collective. Maybe it's not just one celebrity, but maybe there are like 10 celebrities and like a hundred smaller creators coming together to form a collective. That makes sense to become a DAO. But if it's something that's centered on like one creator or one organization, um, I don't see that as a point to kind of make it into a DAO. Having trouble keeping pace with the crypto boom? When your business is scaling up and your portfolio is growing, you don't want to waste precious time on manual treasury management or settling in rebalancing. Fireblocks can handle that for you with smart, scalable solutions for your crypto business, along with industry-leading security and expertise. They'll take care of the back end so you can focus on the big picture. Visit fireblocks.com to learn more. This episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, an integrated solution that provides institutional investors with an advanced trading platform, secure custody, and Prime services to manage all their crypto assets in one place. Coinbase Prime fully integrates crypto trading and custody on a single platform and gives clients the best all-in pricing in their network using their proprietary smart order router and algorithmic execution. Futuristic companies like Tesla and MicroStrategy have already used Coinbase's comprehensive investing platform to execute some of the largest trades in the industry. Build a unified investment portfolio with one of the most trusted names in crypto. Learn more by visiting coinbase.com slash prime to get started today. 
This episode is brought to you by Cross River. Building the next big thing in crypto? Then it's time to get your fiat on and off ramp solution from Cross River. Whether you're a crypto exchange, NFT marketplace, or wallet, Cross River's integrated API based platform provides the payment solutions you need to grow. Cross River is powering the future of financial services. A crypto fin industry award winner and an early partner for companies like Coinbase, Cross River's tech stack supports crypto partners and enables real-time money movement for consumers. Welcome to a new world of crypto-friendly banking. Request your fiat on and off ramp solution now at crossriver.com slash crypto. So Kevin on our team, I just let him know that we have you two on the show and he is an Irene Dow hodler. He has one. I think of the NFTs. What? Why is I know. I thought he was a whale. I, <laughs> I uh, asked him if he had any questions for you guys. And he said, yeah, I already heard that you're having the queen on the pod today. What's coming for holders? What, what should he be expecting soon? A very exciting thing that our DAO members are actually working with a developer to implement some staking system that can utilize the tripod and then also for our future jobs. And also I will be like hosting more in the Twitter space and also in our Discord uh, every week. And also we are going to launch some exclusive NFT collection to support all the charity courses. Okay, wait a second. Walk me through this implementation of a staking system. I have no idea what it is. Um, yeah, this is what, <laughs> this the, is our what the community, is, community doing. Committee is doing right now. Oh, yeah. I see. I mean, this morning that they are working with the developer to see how they can stake Iron Dow Pass to reap some benefit. To earn like a yield from the NFTs? <laughs> I'll be honest, I have no idea. But what <laughs> I do know is that Irene Dow and Soko are going to co-host an event. So we're going to host uh, Irene Dow and Soko kind of like joint party. On Friday. Yeah, on Friday uh, at our house. We're going to have like a like an event. Um, Irene Dow members are invited. We have some other people, like some some clients of Soko, if we're going to invite over. And we're just going to have, uh, you know, just a chill night, mm. eat, drink together yeah so that's one one of the utility if you happen to be in la yeah you're welcome to join us i unfortunately am without bag but i'll pass the message along to kevin so the evolution or the outlook for DAOs and nfts going into the second part of the year or the rest of 2022 what are you guys expecting what might surprise folks yeah, the key trend that I think we'll see is a lot of people realize that not everything has to be a DAO. Right now, a lot of people are kind of creating new projects and they're kind of structuring DAOs around that. I think as we go on, people realize that you don't really need a DAO to kind of do a lot of things. And a lot of organizations are a lot more centralized than you think they are. I mean, aspirationally, we always want to say that this is a decentralized community. Everybody can kind of participate. But if let's say you really want to kind of stick to that and every decision you have people vote, even if you have a really strong community, even the strongest ones, the engagement is usually not that high, right? Most of the time, it's only like maybe 10% somewhat engaged and only 1% that heavily engaged within the community. See, that's probably the biggest problem, Ben. How do you incentivize engagement in any DAO, not just a simp DAO, but any type of DAO? Yes, how do you get people to be engaged enough to participate in key decisions that need to be made? The key thing is this, right? If people are financially driven, right, they're seeking yield, they buy the token just because they expect the price to go up, you can't expect these people to be loyal to the DAO. You can't expect them to engage. And that's why we focus so much on, you know, the other forms of utility, the non-financial utility, a lot of people, they kind of like, oh, I don't want to buy Irene Dow because, you know, the price is not going to go up. I think this should not be seen as a negative thing because this is kind of wiping out all the speculators. These speculators are not going to engage with the community, right? What you really want is to kind of give people non-financial benefit, right? Things that have emotional, sentimental value, people who are already huge fans and they've always wanted to contribute. Mm -hmm. Now you're giving them a kind of platform to contribute out of their own hearts, like they want to actually kind of do something like that, these people will engage, these people are more likely to continue to stay around even when the price is not high, right? Because they genuinely want to kind of support this community, they genuinely want to support like a particular creator. 
I think that is really the key over here. And I think that's why NFTs are also so much better as an instrument for DAOs than ERC-20s. When you have ERC-20s, right, because it's fungible, you'll put it on the exchanges, you'll put it on the pools, people will do flash loans and do votes and it becomes very financially driven. And also the mental model for most people is just not as clear as an NFT, right? If let's say you have like 0.001 token, technically you're still part of the DAO because you kind of hold that token, but are you really invested into this community? Probably not, right? So on the other hand, like an NFT is like one NFT is one membership card. Right. And it also makes it like inherently illiquid, which is a good thing. You actually want people to kind of like every selling decision should be taken with consideration. If I have maybe three NFT, the first one, if I get a good price, I'll sell. Second one, I have to have a really, really good price. The third one, I will never sell because I need to hold at least one to become a member. And I think this is the thing. They should be motivated by intrinsic factors. They should already be a big fan. They should already be wanting to contribute. And then the DAO just gives them a platform to do so. It's interesting. So I guess for folks out there who are seeing bad price, not good price, can that kill a project? No. If it kills your project, it means that your project never had any loyal fans in the first place. I mean, people who seek yield, they're not going to be loyal, right? So they join your project because they think the price is going to go up or they want to earn some yield or whatever. The moment another project comes up that appears to have more yield, they will just jump over to the next project and the next project and the next project. So on the other hand, if it's intrinsically driven, like there's no second Irene, you can't jump over to another Irene down. It's just only one Irene, right? If let's say like it's a sports athlete or whatever, you can't really just jump over to another one because you are fans of this particular person, not a fan of the yield. So Irene, what do you think of this whole experiment? What have been some of the more interesting or bizarre engagements or interactions you've had or some of the more fun, exciting ones? Okay, the thing that motivates the most to do this kind of stuff is because after Irene Dow, I got a lot of creative friends sending DM to me say they want to create their own DAO because they have to make a living by selling ads to their fans. And they don't really like this kind of lifestyle, but they have no choice. But right now with the like Irene DAO, they find that there's a new way for them to engage with their fans where they can just, you know, doing what they are good at, which is producing content. And all the loyal fans are going to reward them with the NFTs they produced. This is the things we see among the creator space. And actually a lot of female creators are more interested in getting into the Web3 space. This is what I find very exciting because right now the, you know, the gender ratio is, is definitely not good enough. And right now like more, much more female creators are willingly to join our Web3 space. And we at Soko, we are trying to make our technology accessible to all these Web2 creators. And we yeah. tend to bring billions of these people into Web3. Yeah. I'll just add one small note over here, right? Because uh, I think a lot of people have a misconception of what Irene Dow is. And uh, I mean, you've seen a lot of copycats, but it basically, what they're doing is not really Irene Dow. I mean, if you look at the copycats, what they're doing is that they're selling an NFT. And by holding this NFT, you get access to a gated channel where the creator posts exclusive content over here. This is not what we're trying to promote because this is just OnlyFans 2.0, but it's worse than OnlyFans because if, let's say, OnlyFans creator stops creating content, the fans can just unsubscribe. But if, let's say, you're doing an NFT, the fans have already paid in full, right? And you have to believe in good faith that even though the creator has already been paid out in full, the creator is going to continue posting exclusive content right? Uh, this honestly doesn't work out. The incentives don't align. And we have already seen examples of this in like the sports scene where people just stick the NFT money and then they just like soft run, right? Because they already got all the money paid up right at the front. So this is not what Irene Dow is actually promoting. What we are really doing is a decentralized fan community. Oh, and another very interesting thing we saw is that we have a lot of Web2 media coverage on like NetShark, on The Verge, on um, from Sunday Vice, Morning uh, yeah. Post. It's very exciting because, I mean, like, of course, Boya and then Punk, this kind of like OG NFT project get a lot of coverage. But it's the first time that it's kind of, you know, selfie uh, NFT got so much noise in the Web2 space. Well, I think it's because it presents a big opportunity for creators, which is a more nascent category within the cryptocurrency market. It's certainly interesting how it might open up new demographies, new types of people to what Web3 is. Ben, you made a really interesting point. Projects that are basically taking crypto 
and replicating what exists in Web 2 versus the ones that are creating more dynamic experiences. I had Kyle Samani on the show the other day, and he touched on this dichotomy and compared it to the way in which the internet looked in its earliest days. If you look at something like the New York Times website in the 1990s, it was effectively a static image of the New York Times in the paper form. So Mm -hmm. it was really just not innovative in terms of its form. And it's interesting that there's also this dichotomy playing out in NFTs, in the new blockchain-based creator economy. You have folks who are leveraging the technology, but not really making the experience that different from the analog world. And then maybe folks who are trying to really extract as much of the innovation out of what you can do with this technology. Yeah, of course. I think that's completely right. When we look at a lot of the startups that we've seen in the social space, that is a big reason why they haven't really got a mainstream. Because the idea that we're looking at over here is that if it's not broken, don't fix it, right? You look at a lot of these uh, influencers, a lot of these creators, they love TikTok, right? They love Instagram. If it wasn't for TikTok, they won't be able to have their viral dance get them like 1 million followers. So that's not the problem over here. A lot of startups are trying to create like a decentralized version of Twitter where you own all of your content. And this pitch just doesn't really appeal to these creators because like, why do I need to own my content uh, when these platforms are helping me get famous, helping me actually make a living? The issue that that they're facing right now is that the engagement with the fans is not good enough. Right now, they can just like reply to comments on TikTok or, you know, like very, very minimal ways of interaction. Or maybe if you're looking at like monetization, there's not a lot of ways to monetize apart from, you know, like selling out, so-called like selling out, uh, doing a lot of advertisements or doing like an OnlyFans or things that people might not really be very keen to kind of do, right? And this is the part where Web3 and the whole concept of like ownership, being able to get your fans to communicate with each other, things like these actually fundamentally change the game. And you just cannot do that in Web2. So let's look at some of the Web2 platforms. How can a platform like OnlyFans become Web3? What can they do? If you were sort of running biz dev there, Mm -hmm. what other things could they maybe do? Yeah. So this is just ideas, right? Potentially what, what they could do Maybe a few of the OnlyFans creators can come together, they have a membership. By owning this, you get access to maybe like a pool party where the girls are going to show up and then you can like meet and greet. Or uh, Maybe you can have something where like this gives you like exclusive access to maybe like some of the content that they put out first. You get to see them like three days earlier than everybody else, right, with this, with this NFT. Or, you know, maybe it's just like those with a huge following. Some of them, they are just like self-proclaimed sims and they do a lot of like fan content. They do like fan art and everything for their favorite creators. Maybe uh, just by having a membership to like their exclusive community, the fans can interact with each other. They can help to organize the parties and feel like they're part of the process, right? Instead of like, I went to this event, it's like I helped to organize this event and now they feel more confident in like kind of promoting it. Because right now you see like nobody's promoting like, oh, this is my favorite OnlyFans creator. Come, let me share share with you the link. (laughs) Nobody's doing something like that, right? Well, there might be a few reasons why they're not doing that. But now let's say if the fan is actually like a super fan, part of this community, right? They want to grow the community. They want to kind of make this creator more popular. They have more incentive to actually kind of help to spread the word about like, this is the best creator. You have to follow her, right? So things like these are ideas that a platform like OnlyFans can actually explore. These are new experiences that are just not possible in Web2 because there isn't that ownership aspect of things. Mm. Okay. Well, we'll have to leave it there. I'd like to thank you both for coming on the show. Where can our listeners learn more about what you and Irene are working on, Ben? So I think the best place would be to follow us on Twitter. Mm-hmm. I mean, I haven't been tweeting from our Twitter You do account. have to follow us on Twitter. Okay. Irene's tweeting. Irene, what's your Twitter handle for the folks to know? It's just Irene Zhao. Underscore. 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 There we go. Blue tick. So it's very easy to find me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Irene is probably the best place to follow what we're doing. A lot of the stuff that we have shared with you, you know, a lot of things we can't announce yet, but over the next couple of months, we're going to have a lot of very exciting projects. They're going to push the utility and a lot of like real life applications of NFTs. So yeah, we'll be seeing a lot more. Bravo. Bravo. Thank you both for joining us. Appreciate your time. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.
The Scoop will be back for you again with another great guest. Have an amazing day.